Hey, welcome back everybody to my podcast. And as you know, this episode is also brought to you by my new sponsor, ProBoss.com. ProBoss.com has over seven leagues around the world. And if you're a basketball nerd or a fanatic, please go to ProBoss.com. Check out different searches for players, player profiles, teams, your league teams, any teams around the world. You'll find them on ProBoss.com and you can get all nerdy with it, which we also did with Francesco Cuzzolini in this episode. We analyze some data that he takes from box scores after games and then goes along for the next couple of days of how to recover the players that play a little bit less. He looks at the minutes and then how to organize the schedule for the players for the team the next days after the game. We also talked about exercises, exercises for players, but most importantly, exercises for coaches because they sit all day, most of the time, cutting down tape, watching tape. So he broke down some exercises that coaches should do and some activities that they should find in order to have some balance and to have some fun. We also talked about communication, players, his time in Toronto as a Toronto Raptors head of performance. Uh, so there are a lot of things, a lot of details here to take care of, but you will see, you will find some nuggets that will interest you. And this, is, this podcast is for all kinds of branches in the basketball world that can take a whole bunch of different things from it. So please enjoy. And if you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe to this channel. It's very important to grow as a platform and then get new guests in here as well. So thanks a lot for being here and see you soon. Bye. Good. So welcome to my podcast. Oh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be one of your celebrities. You know, I saw so many basketball celebrities. We have done, you have, uh, you know, uh, interviews in the past. So thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here. So the last ones were Boris Diaz, Sergio Scariolo, and Francesco Cusolin. Okay, I'm the last of the line. <laughs> Comparing with the others, I'm absolutely the last of the line. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm very I'm very uh, I'm pleased that how this podcast has turned out, and I'm very happy to get get these high level guests on me from different from different fields of of the basketball world, but. Eventually, I'm going to go to other 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 sports as well, and I have before. But I'm very honored to have these guests on, just such as you. And it's it's really a pleasure to talk about high level basketball, high level sports, high level performance, uh, physically, mentally, and we're going to dive into all of those things here together with you. No, once again, my pleasure. You know, every time that you are you, you are having a chance to share your experience and knowledge, is always a big uh, opportunity to grow. So thank you for having me here. Yeah, and I'm sure our guests are excited to hear your side of things and your experiences because they they reach from the NBA to Europe to national team to education and universities. Before that, I wanted to ask you something to, to break the ice a little bit, just to break. But our, our ice is broken already anyway. But uh, we had the I remember our dinner in, in Milano when the uh, first time I met you and we had an extensive talk. Uh, Dan Shamir was there and somebody else was there. I can't remember. That was during the final four in Milano 2014. But I was wondering if, because our business is also a lot of times, um, it's revolving around dinners, you know, it's revolving around it's it, it, natural networking opportunities, but it's more about friendship dinners, breaking bread with your friends, and then kind of socializing in the, in the basketball slash sports slash life environment. What's, what's one of the most mem more memorable dinners that you had? Uh, honestly, it's true what you say, many of them. And, um, uh... It's a dinner, but it's also, um, let's say, an opportunity to share ideas, uh, controversies. You know, uh, basketball and the high performance world is a world of complexity. You know, so <laughs> there doesn't exist one solution that fits all the problems. You know, so having opportunity to to share your problems and and choices and uh, and, and 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 feelings and emotions. With professionals at at, uh, at the at the highest level is a great opportunity to grow. Like I told you, you know, uh, this is an interview. Probably I'm providing to you and and our listeners from uh, experiences, but I'm learning from our discussion because every time you have to explain what you have done and why you have done in that way in that specific moment, it's a way to put some order in your thoughts and your mind and 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 also in your daily job. So uh, let's say that it, it was a kind of, um, I call it mindfulness moment, you know, when you just, uh, uh, I mean, take everything away from you, you just focus, like you say, friends and having, let's say, 
a, a, a relaxed moment where you can talk freely about uh, your view and uh, your aspirations and your fears some, some time because uh, yes. it, you know it, it's a, it's a it's a word with a lot of uh, uh, ups and downs it's a word uh, uh, with a lot of uh, emotions you got to manage yourself uh, uh, plays the stresses uh, you know uh, coaches so once again it's it's, it's a roller coaster is an amazing roller coaster because i think it's one is one of the best lives that i could think when i was a i mean just a young professional but uh you know uh, if, if you take care about your job you like to share you know and uh, uh, not not just uh, like i told you uh not just a knowledge uh, experience science this is a way okay for sure it's important for me to teach a university important for me to attend to clinics around the globe it's important but sometimes behind the stage that moment is absolutely you know uh, priceless yes it's it's something that you can let your guard down you know you can share yeah. and you can honestly you can grow with with from each other help each other and changing seeing different angles, changing perspectives a little bit, and then adjusting, like you said, adjusting your 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 path in certain yeah, situations. Your, your, your ideas as well. You yeah. know, if you want me to just to list a few, I still remember, you know, one of my mentors was a, a Albert Mail at the time during the 90s. Al was the head strength conditioning for the Chicago Bulls, that Chicago Bulls. You know, and uh, I, I was the, I had the opportunity to go to Chicago for for uh for for uh, for a, a training camp during the summer and you know just uh, taking any word from his experience he was a very open he, he's a very open man you know uh sharing from uh, from a technical aspect of the, his job but also experiencing experiences uh, behind the stage it was for me you know a, a mentor you know he, he told me how to approach to many many things just to mention one from my from my job let's say coaches many you know you learn from the coaches uh every time you know just uh you know sitting around the table and uh and uh when the lights are off not when the lights are on okay so when you got the chance to to talk freely about experiences so all the let's say top coaches with which uh, I've worked in the past, from uh, Mike D'Antoni to uh, Zelimir Obradovic uh, to Coach Blatt uh, uh, to Coach Messina, I don't want to miss someone to Coach <laughs> Gianni. You know, all, um, all of them gave me something. Just talking about uh, experiences, uh, let's say uh, be behind the stage, like I said. You know that one thing that that I that's jumped to my mind is when you when I was observing also the coaches when for example, um, Coach Messina when I was with with with, Miss, with with Coach in Moscow, but also I know Brad Stevens was very very precise with that, and I'm sure you observe the the same thing is the choice of words that the coaches of the highest level that they have that they use that they prepare. How much do you prepare yourself when you know you have to? not necessarily have presentations, but talking to the team, talking to players, how much do you prepare yourself in terms of the choices of words that you use to portray the message that you want to portray? This is a very interesting, important message because uh, you don't learn by yourself how to communicate properly. You got you to gotta educate yourself. And um, I made many mistakes at the beginning, you know, just because I was a... Uh, underestimating this aspect of how important is communication and now I, I try to force my my students as well to go uh you know to to improve their ability on 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 communication because you cannot you can study all the training methodology in the world so this is the first step of our let's say um, growing process so improving knowledge after there is the second step that is trying to put this, that knowledge on the field so you got to be able to educate your players, to prepare your players. So from the, the theory to the practical aspect. And after you got to be able to explain to uh, players, coaches, management, why you are doing in um, your job in that way, which kind of choices in the critical moment doesn't exist one solution, how you choose the proper one, how to uh, you can explain to people that probably has not the same knowledge in that specific field how things are are going and why. So 
it's absolutely uh, a priority, you know, to learn how to communicate. A, 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 a rival, you say, the top coaches are great speakers. They never uh, talk, uh, you know, without uh, uh, meaning. They are always, uh, you know, sometimes emotions can, uh, uh, okay, can create some problems. Uh, but once again, controlling motion is important in this job, you know, uh, because uh, it's important during the game, before the game, after the game. So, uh, and think about for 90 or more games a season. So when I was mentioning before, you know, roller coaster, you got to be able to manage the emotion before the game and, and trying to provide to the team, staff, media, proper communication during the game proper communication right after the, the game you know doesn't matter if it's a win a loss proper communication the day after you know restarting rebuilding again emotions after a win after a loss so absolutely it's a it's a it's a master and uh, something you can uh, read from others you can learn from others but you gotta create your own way of uh, communicating properly you gotta judge yourself okay that's a, a very important part don't uh, don't worry uh, don't be worried of of judging yourself when things are going well or when things are going uh, in in the wrong direction you know if you judge yourself and you and you can make the changes that are necessary to improve i think i think this one is the best approach you know it's normal to make mistakes it's part of the job but if you realize that it was a mistakes and you can do better I think it's a big part of the solution. So that's a, that's a key point. Also, communication. Everybody knows. I'm 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 going. That's that's my valley uh, alley. Uh, and there's a big point that you say everybody makes mistakes. And I think it's even so more important to ad admit to mistakes. Admit to mistakes to the staff. Admit to mistakes to the players. And it's it's a key thing that you don't continue to make the same mistakes. But mistakes also are part of the game on the court as well as off the court. And I think. Genuine, sincere communication is respected by professionals. If you are trying to hide it, you're gonna be come out as, as a fake. You know, you're gonna you're gonna come out, you're gonna come across as somebody that's trying to front and trying to be somebody else. And so I think it's always important to jump the gun. And if you see the communication is going the wrong way or something that you made that you made a mistake on. I wouldn't be afraid and I was never afraid to admit to something that I did wrong. And I think that then your peers respect you and that creates a little bit even a thicker bond between each other, especially within the staff. Especially, I, I remember I had to make a phone call to Coach Messina, by the way. I, I, I told the story before, but I, 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 was scouting, I was scouting the place of the opponents at the time and we were going through a walkthrough the, the, the evening before the game and it was still, we had a walkthrough on game day the next day. So it was not like the final, but it was still, there was the practice, we scrimmage, we, we tried to prepare the defense. And there was a zipper zipper play, and the the guy instead of the foreman was lifting instead of going to the corner, and I had the other way around, and because I saw I saw the clips, and I felt like that was more of 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 going to the corner instead of lifting, and I was correcting the coach, and I was correcting him, and then I realized went back with the assistant coaches when coach left, we went through the clips, and I was like, oh no, I because I was already watching. You know, you always as a as a scout, you also have to prepare the next games. Hey, yeah, well, watching ahead, always ahead. And and then you know, sometimes at some point, you, the clips start getting mixed up. You start seeing the the patterns, and then in, in that moment, I was just kind of, um, yeah, I was ahead of myself, and I had to make the phone call. And I was making sure the staff was in the in the in the in the uh, locker room. And I called coach. Coach was pissed off to say the least okay. but, but okay. it's not it's normal i mean you you have to admit to mistake oh, it was a big mistake next morning you still have time to correct it you talk to the team and you say hey we're gonna change this because because the and the tape they do this more and that's it you move on as long as it's getting corrected in time before the game you know that's something that you you that i have to you, you have to be honest to yourself and at the end to the team yeah honesty and transparency is always a uh, well appreciated and uh, there is a quote i don't know if it's a, is if, if i can tell the quote in a proper way but it costs much more energy to cover a lie that say the truth you know so uh once again uh try to do your best okay so this is the the starting point if you're always trying to push yourself in the best way sometimes it's normal you know L like you say i was trying i was um, i was ahead you know 
the 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 moment so pro- sometimes when you are pushing too hard and it's normal pushing hard in a world of competition where you're trying to perform at the highest level so you are on the edge or doing right doing wrong or anticipating time so it, it's part of our life so sometimes you can say look it's my fault i'm very very sorry um probably the uh, things should be done differently uh, i i was uh, in that moment, you know, sure that the situation could be done in that specific way. And uh, let's start again. Let's start over, you know. So absolutely uh, important. And I prefer this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, disagreements with players, with coaches, with um, staff members. That, that, like I say, you know, try to uh, build up your dignity. Doesn't matter what. Because, because it's not a real dignity, okay? Yeah. It's, yeah, Jordan, just Jordan Peterson also said something similar like that. Say, always say the truth, and that's that's an adventure. Yeah. That's that's the real adventure to always say the truth, and that's you're gonna see where it's gonna lead to. If you're always trying to sneak around, it's gonna catch up, and that's that's not an adventure. Um, so one thing that I also wanted to touch on, and because you had so many roles in the past, and one of the most significant roles probably, and I'm sure you realize the significance of being the first international strength and conditioning coach in the NBA with the Raptors. Besides that, and I always tell my guests, you know, may the achievements rest in peace. And this is just, you know, we, I'm not going to be able to mention everything that you have achieved in your career. But one thing that I feel like is important to touch on is the, the, Understanding the significance of that when you went over and something that you learned when you got there that you that was impossible to prepare for that they, that you, you saw that the NBA does different, you know, something that you realized when you got there, that's like, oh, OK, now you, you felt like you were prepared, but then it's some there's a little bit of a mind shift there. Was there something like that happening? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, because uh, like you say, uh, NBA is, is becoming more global you know uh, in terms of players and coaches and and uh, and uh, staff members as well so w- when i've been there was season 2009 so many years ago 15 years ago and um you know i went there with a lot of ideas in my mind so now i'm the in the best place in the world for me it was like a park of amu- an amusement park you know so uh after all the experience in Europe with the Euroleague teams, with I mean national teams and and uh, uh, let's say FIBA basketball at the highest level, you know, having the opportunity to work in NBA for me was a kind of dream. But like you say, the reality is completely different. So you cannot just uh, make a simple uh, copy and paste and thinking that everything's working. Amount of games. Okay, first of all, uh, how. Uh, players are managed it's completely different you know um, always the season if you play the postseason or you play or you don't play the, the postseason um, uh, all the players at that time so I'm speaking about 15 years ago um, they had uh, um, like a let's say a personal staff working behind them and you have to find an agreement to share information knowledge to work with them because it's not like in Europe at that time that uh, your team or your organization during the season was covering all the activities. So when you have a top players like uh, happened to me at that time, or Chris Bosch or, or uh, I don't know, uh, DeMar DeRozan now at the time was my rookie. These kind of players, you know, you got to understand which is uh, uh, the opportunity that you have having the player in your organization, but also which is the, the company, the business behind the player. So you got to be able... Uh, to be transparent, to be available, and uh, your solution, your solution is just part of a problem. It's not the main solution. So once again, uh, um, I found a new reality. I was trying to find a compromise between, uh, let's say, a more structured um, working mentality that we had in Europe because it was easier to be structured in Europe, and uh, a more, let's say, open and um, Ready to, uh, uh, ready, ready to make changes. You know, ready uh, to face variability. Because in NBA, 
situation can change so fast because we have so many gains, many results. So everything is moving faster and faster. So if your working system is a structure, but it's systematic, but it's slow, it's not taking uh, uh, under account all the variables, probably is meaningless. So it was a very important part uh, um, uh, to test my uh, training approach. And uh, honestly, my best reward has been that when I did decide to come back in Europe and I spoke with my organization and uh, currently uh, the, the current, uh, let's say, uh, GM of the Raptors, Masai Ujiri, was assistant uh, GM at my time. And they asked me which could be the guy that could take my place. And it meant a lot to me because it means that, uh, let's say, my years with the organization uh, were not uh, meaningless. Yeah. I brought some news. And my assistant uh, uh, coach at that time is still the head of performance of the Raptors after 15 years. And last summer, I was invited to go in Toronto after the COVID outbreak, all this mess, to have some meetings together, to update our knowledge and our experience. So what do you think about how things are going in Europe? What do you think can be done in our organization? So words are getting closer and closer, but don't make the mistake to think that everything that's working here could work uh, you know, over the pound because it's not true, absolutely true. You gotta be smart and clever to find, say a concrete adaptation to a completely new reality with different balances, with different difficulties. If you're doing this step to adapt, change, shift some ideas in terms of procedures, uh, uh, players management, training load, um, return to play procedures, you can do a great job. I think that's the key point also in general, also in coaching, there's no absolute truth. There's not one truth. You know, everybody creates their own truth through experiences and that's on an individual basis, but then also on a cultural basis, there's a completely different way of communicating the way things are handled, the way things are perceived, the way things, the way people are acting and performing out. Cause I can think of my first example would be coaches, American coaches are coming to Europe or vice versa, you know, like the, the European coaches have to restrain themselves emotionally yeah. when they come to the U.S. It's a completely different approach where in in the, in Europe, when the U.S. coaches come over and they are in the U.S. mindset in the terms of professionalism and, and uh, emotional control and a little bit more of a stoic approach. It's gonna, it can it can go it can run into problems because the players are not used to it. They they see they they have a need for a different emotional outbreak or emotional uh, holding them accountable in a different way. You know, in the in the NBA, it's a different way. And then and Coach Messina said it before. It's uh, in on my podcast as well. One first episode. Different does not mean wrong. It's just different. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's so there's absolutely there's, it's just different. Yeah. So there's the, the truth, the truth, everybody has their own truth. It's just a different way of doing things, coming to the same result. And everybody's trying to get the, the, the same result, which is win. I can tell you this story about my coach at the time, Jay Triano. You know, he was very open coach, great coach, and open, very open person. No? And he brought me this example. Say, Co uh, Kuzo, um, uh, the NBA season is more a marathon run. You got to be able to keep a constant pace the highest pace possible, but a constant pace. Jay was a, a good player in Europe as well, so he knows very well, you know, which is the European basketball reality. And he told me, you know what? In Europe, it's more a sequence of sprints. So you, you have an all-out performance every game, you know, and you got to be able to relax, to chill out a bit, to make another sprint, okay? If you are bringing this experience of sprinting in NBA after three months you have no energy to cover the whole season interesting it yeah. was a very clear example to me and, and Jay was very say clever and keen person uh, to bring a you know to a new European strength conditioning course facing NBA this clear story and uh, and I took I took the challenge you know uh, because it was very important but I did change a lot of approach. Uh, for sure, having a structure in terms of uh, assessment, uh, uh, individualizing procedures, uh, uh, treating players uh, differently, you know. Uh, so a lot of things that now are common in, in Europe as well. Believe me, European basketball is, I mean, uh, EuroLeague mainly 
is, I mean, very, very close in terms of uh, uh, how you prepare games, how you manage players, players that play a lot of minutes, players are not playing many minutes, and, and so on, you know, giving important importance to the training phase, but also the recovery phase. So the two, the say, words are getting closer and closer. This is why a lot of activities in terms of communication and education as well are sharing information from Europe, NBA, and back. Mm -hmm. In the past, we were facing and watching NBA try to steal some ideas. Now it's absolutely, you know, an, an a win-win situation, up and yeah. down situation. It's a complete exchange of, of, of information yeah. and experiences that are comparable. Maybe the amount, because of the difference of budgets, obviously the amount of staff makes a huge difference in Europe versus the amount of travel and the way to travel. That's, those are the things that are, that are key differences, I think, that also impact the recovery of players, which we will, we will get to this topic. Uh, before we go to the topic, I wanted to pivot a little bit in terms of cognitive load because high performance, uh, like you, you have occupied several high-level positions at the, at the same time, which you do now as well in, in, in the education realm at university in Spain. In, in Sevilla, you said? Yeah, in Murcia. Murcia. Uh, in Sevilla as well, yeah. Yeah, well, then then also head of performance in Milano. Then you con you're consulting different, you, Techno Gym, you, uh, also the Players Association you consult. Yeah, yeah, I work on the Performance Advisory Board for the EuroLeague Player Association as well. So, so this is, these are all high level, very a big cognitive load from the different areas of your, of your job. How do you organize yourself? And how do you, what, what tools do you use to, you know, separate all these different topics? Because those are, you know, like you said, the dynamic world of a EuroLeague team, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely dynamic. And I, the one thing that I wanted, I, one term that I wanted to bounce to you, maybe you can bounce off of that. And maybe that's something that, that um, can be of interest. It's a new term I learned with the, with the corporate coach that I had a conversation with on the flight, random conversation. And I asked him about work-life balance and how to balance certain things. Uh, and that also touches on work, handling different things within the work realm. Um, he said work-life balance doesn't exist and balance in general doesn't exist. It's just only organized disbalance. So you're, you're always in a disbalance. You just have to organize, prioritize, and then put the right things on top and then let the other things either delegate to somebody else or find ways to, to not care about them right now. I'm I'm absolutely in, the, in this approach, you know. Um, for, first of all, uh, what you mentioned about my 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 job, it looks that I'm doing three jobs, but believe me, they are connected strategically connect each other, okay. because uh, if you are uh, let's say uh, working for a top level organiz sport organization, uh, technology is a very important part of, uh, of your job. So I have a PhD in physical exercise applied to industrial engineering. So for me, understanding um, which kind of technology uh, to consider or which kind of technology can simplify my working and, and my, my, um, uh, my colleagues' uh, working life is absolutely important. So having opportunity to, be, uh, to work for a company like Technology that is one of the top or, or probably the top company in the world about fitness and biomedical equipment means that I'm always having opportunity to talk with the engineers, uh, project manager, uh, uh, having uh, uh, knowledge in terms of, uh, of uh, innovation, you know, which new technologies are uh, coming uh, to the market and how, um, in, I see which kind of advantages this technology is bringing at that specific moment. So this is the technological part. Uh, universities, okay. Scientific communication uh, training uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's can be evidence based. So taking care about the, the scientific approach, but it's also the practical aspect of how you apply training. But the scientific approach is the starting part. So working for university and uh, having a lot of activities around uh, um, my job at university, like a PhD uh, tribunal or uh, I don't know researches. It means having, let's say, a flow of information that are brand new information. So I'm bringing brand mm -hmm. new information about my daily job, and you know, working for a for a top organization like uh, like Olympia Milano allow me to try uh, to apply or to 
uh, deny, you know, all, all of them or some of them. So my job now is well structured after long, <laughs> because uh, after many years just on the field, and when you're working like, a, I don't know, add strength conditioning coach for, for an NBA team or for a Euroly team, you know, you are always traveling. You are always working with players. You are always, uh, you know, preparing or trying to solve the last problem for the next game. Okay. So you have no time for yourself. So let's say that I was able, after my last experience with the, the Italian national team, uh, to reorganize my job. First of all, I'm not working because I'm enjoying so much what I'm doing. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult, you know, to explain to the, you know, I try to explain to, to, to my wife, to my family that I'm working. But, you know, they don't, don't take this, <laughs> these excuse for me. It says, you, you are working. You never stop working. So it cannot be just work, you know. This is life. This is life. <laughs> this is life. This is true. And back to the, your last consideration, that was absolutely great at what you say doesn't exist a work-life balance exists how you can let's say organize yourself uh, for sure family is a priority no question about it uh, if things are not going well your family is difficult to have energy for your daily job i think this is neutral we are human being so this is a uh, you know uh, i think the main let's say uh, goal and and task of our life uh, but when you are enjoying so much what you are doing and you are working so hard you know, uh, you cannot jump just all over the places because I like also to be a very concrete person. Uh, if you're working in an organization, you got to solve problems. To solve problems, you, you got to be um, present. Uh, you got to understand which can be the solution. Most of the time, solution can be more than one. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you cannot have 24-7 uh, energy for 365 days a year. So once again, how we are able, with our knowledge, to manage uh, training load, recovery, performance, uh, uh, vacation. You gotta be able to manage also our our working agenda and uh, and all, let's say, um, the the, uh, the the accomplishments that we have, you know, with our with with our family as well. So it, it doesn't. Uh, come by by itself you want to work on it once again sometimes you're making some mistakes it's part of the process but being honest understanding that this is a mistake you can do better is the real energy that push me uh ahead every day you know when uh when um i waking up in the morning i have so many things to do but believe me my agenda is well organized <laughs> you <know? laughs> do you do you prepare yourself the, the evening before of what you're going to do the next day always always uh, if, if if you watch my i i want to plan myself ahead in terms of weeks or months because mm -hmm. every time for, for example if i have a clinic you know it's a, it's a, it's a great responsibility for me so i'm going there prepare you know i'm going there having a clear idea which is the communication which is the message you know i'm not just uh, say okay one man show i'm going there i have so much experience i can uh, let's say uh um perform on a jam session no 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 no. this is not myself mm -hmm. but the meeting as well if i have a meeting with coaches on a specific task i'm going there prepare yeah you know yeah. prepare means bringing if i can numbers uh, analysis you know because sometimes you know in a very emotional moment you gotta take decisions okay mm -hmm. so my job is to bring a kind of consistency after after we can decide that we are going right we are going left or, and after the staff decision is my decision, but I have to prepare myself. I have to bring some value, not just mm -hmm. attending because I, I can bring a, many excuses because I was tired, I'm overwhelmed with many things to do, I cover this, no, 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 no. I decide my job and my life is not coming from others. Mm -hmm. So something that that you can come to me offer me something and it doesn't fit my my idea my feel my goals or can affect you know negatively so what i'm doing i can easily say no so i'm doing many things yes i'm doing many things because i consider that in my um, professional let's say uh, growth is important to have uh, connections not just on one specific field because it closes completely your mind 
I'm the guy that I'm bringing energy inside the organization. I'm bringing technology inside the organization. I'm bringing new uh, procedures. And am I open? You know, if you're coming uh, to Milan, you can watch our practice and you can sit with me one hour just discussing about what we are doing. Because, you know, I'm on the process. But believe me, we are prepared to do it. It doesn't come from itself. And I think it's also important to have, because you do have a variety of, of information from the, the same field, but from different branches, I think it's also important. And I, 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 it happens by chance. It's not planned. But I listen to a lot of information from other parts you know, of, of outside sports, from philosophy, psychology. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, Modern Wisdom is my favorite one currently. But there's a lot of things that they talk about that are don't, not, not sports related. But I can use that information when the moment arrives. And I can't predict the moment, but I, I see the moment when the, it arrives in a basketball situation or in a coaching situation or in a scouting situation where I can use that information and apply it from the outside world, from, from whatever other field it is, into that field. That's why I think it's important to not to be speci too specialized in one field because you are shielding yourself off from other information that can be valuable in your field. Absolutely. Big value what you say uh, right now. Uh, like human being, we grow through experiences. As many experiences you can do in your life from different fields, working experiences, okay, um, life experiences, better is your view, more open you are, you know, um, better you can uh, also uh, adapt to uh, variability. I don't know if you have never read a, a book about uh, Nicholas uh, um, Taleb, about the black swan and anti-fragility. I've, I've heard, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, Nicola Nassim Taleb wrote this book and, and uh, has brought, to, let's say, uh, to the public uh, uh, this definition of anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is not re resilience, you know, okay? Resilience is the way you can resist to difficulties. Anti-fragility comes from your ability to grow, to be better from difficulties. Mm -hmm. Or how you face the difficulty, how you react. And uh, it was working in a trade market and it's, it's a word of variability. It was bringing his, his life experience. Like if you are able to live in this variability, in this unbalanced world, mm -hmm. okay, to you build yourself stronger and stronger because you are ready to, to face everything that is changing around you. And um, he saw a lot of people that were always doing, let's say, the same job from years, just a light change in their uh, life can create a lot of problems or people that are continuously, you know, uh, looking for new experiences, new job, new countries, uh, new relationship. It doesn't mean, you know, a love relationship, but connecting with people from different fields. Like you say, I'm very interested to talk with a philosopher. Mm -hmm. You know, it was an, an aspect of my high school experience, absolutely negative. And after I realized in my life, it's like a, it's like a, a mirror of life, you know. Yes, yeah. I learn so much from philosophers from the past, from the classics. So you know, we are evolving. If you're an open mind person, your evolution would be for sure bigger. I I hundred percent agree. This is this is the life. This is the world I'm living in. I and sometimes there's uh, in terms of cognitive load, there's information overload that I I it's impossible for me to remember everything. But then bits and pieces, the, 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 off, the more often I listen to it or I see it or I hear it and the more often it repeats itself in the, from the outside world, the better. And I see that it becomes more prevalent in my daily life because that's something that's reoccurring all the time. So let's pivot again. Let's pivot. Just do, just do a basketball pivot to the other <laughs> side. So before we go into the, into the, uh, the athlete's recovery and, and, and observation and performance, I want to also touch on the staff because I have a hard feeling. I have feelings for the staff, obviously for the coaching staff. And that's one of the key issues. And I'm dealing with it right now because you can take my car wreck of a body, let's say, because I have a back pain now for over half a year. And now I'm selfishly for over a year. And I'm selfishly going to use this podcast now to also touch on that because a lot of coaches are dealing with that. How can you fight or how can you combat uh, prolonged sitting for coaches assistant coaches that are in a video room that always are cutting up tape and and encourage them or find ways to exercise 
while also getting the, the job done and not forgetting not forgetting their, their health in in that process because it a lot of times you're sitting for hours you know so you got to break it up somehow and find ways to exercise or is stretching overvalued undervalued which exercises should matter which how do, which top three things to prioritize for the coaches another great question thank you you know because you 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 give, you give me these opportunities to go through a lot of very interesting topics um coaches um health it's a uh, absolutely a priority not just the physical health like you mentioned but the way you can manage stress as well and the solution are different but you know stress has different three main sources cognitive like you mentioned before physical stress seated or working out you know it's different but staying city for five, six hours or traveling a lot of uh, a video room or meetings, you know, it's very, very stressful. And third, the emotional part, okay? So what are we doing with coaches? For sure, we try to push coaches to work out, but not once in a while when I'm free, uh, work out, you know, exercise is medicine, okay? So you got to be able to take the right pill at the right moment, but with a good consistency. If not, it's unaffected. What do I have to choose? I'm going to play golf. I'm going to run. I'm going to play tennis. Okay, all these activities are important. But thinking about your physical, uh, let's say, structure, so your body, your musculoskeletal skeletal system, strength training is the priority. Because as you are getting older, it's normal, and science can do document it, this, we are losing limb body mass. We are losing strength and uh, staying in city for hours becomes heavier and heavier because you overload your joints more than in the past. Okay. So in the past, you could run for hours. Now, if you're going to jog for 30 minutes, probably you have some aches all over the body or some sharp pain. Okay. But it's not just question you are getting old because muscles are not covering joints and bones and the skeletal like, like in the past. So if I'm giving you providing you a list of priorities the main one is strength training because it's working on strength so limb body mass but also for coaches mainly male coaches but not just male coaches on the hormonal activity that gradually is dropping down as as we are aging okay Horm hormonal hor hormones hormonal yeah. activity mm -hmm. testosterone testosterone exactly exactly so once again, now science is very clear on that, that strength training for people that are aging is a priority and can solve a lot of degeneration problems or, or a lot of, let's say, issues that you're bringing from your former career, like player, for example. You know, many former yes. coach, many yes. coaches were former players and uh, all of a sudden they interrupt completely all the activities and they can easily go overweight, and they can easily lose uh, limb body mass. And honestly, is this situation of being a player all of a sudden stop all the activities is, is worse for your body than from a normal people that wasn't doing much in their in their in their youth, for example. Um, so once again, for sure, one activity, the main one is strength training. Second one, find an activity that can relax your mind, you know, that that um, it's fun for you, you know. Bef go. Be before before we go into this fun activity, do you have uh, which parts are strength training should be on of the strength training should be focused on the back, legs, back. glutes? Okay, for sure. The the one that you have mentioned, or oh, the deep muscle of your spine has to be, uh, uh, let's say, stimulated with training. Isometric training for the spine is one of the main, uh, let's say, activities to reduce stress. Why I say isometric? Because we have two different kinds of muscles. The dynamic muscles, the one that create motion, and the postural muscles that are more deep in our body that usually work isometrically, is isometrically or with small motions. Mm -hmm. So these muscles, if they lose strength and the tone, they can overload joints. Mm -hmm. So isometric strength training for the spine. Uh, keeping glutes, if you stay uh, sitting for many, many years, also the sitting position, take away tension from the glutes. And probably you have your hamstring that are really, really stiff. 
Mm -hmm. So taking away stiffness from an hamstring, because when you are sit, stay seated, you know, your knee angle is 90 degrees. So it's normal that your hamstring are becoming stiffer and stiffer and you're losing tone on the glutes. So strengthening glutes, isometric work for your spine, stretching or taking away tension from hamstring. So working on the, with, I don't know, myofascial release, stretching, yoga, whatever you like, with your whatever you enjoy can create a more elasticity. And, uh, you know, having a good pox posture is coming from these main um, exercises. All the yeah. others can be, you know, useful, but, you know, if you, if you are uh, making a, a specific question, this is my, my okay. answer. So isometric work for the spine, strengthening glutes is very important for the uh, locomotion mechanics, but also for the pelvis uh, um, uh, mechanics as well taking away tension from hamstrings because a seated position is creating uh, stiffness on the hamstrings. And uh, it's not easy if your hamstrings are very, very stiff. Probably your uh, vertebras, your joints, has some, uh, let's say, um, stressful range of motion more mm -hmm. than normally. So keeping mobility at the best ranges is also important when you are staying, when you are seated for so many hours during, during your day. Second activity that I, I like to provide to my coaches, find something that is fun for you. Do you like to swim? Go swimming in a pool by yourself. Do you like uh, riding a bike? Go riding a bike. If it's possible, open air. If it's possible, you know, with different uh, environment, because uh, coaches usually are on the basketball floor or in the meeting room or on a plane or on a bus, okay? So in my opinion, if I'm going to play squash, more or less is the same environment okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's better do you like to play tennis go play go to play tennis if the weather is fine go to play uh outdoor uh do you like jog go jogging you know anytime that you want that you like something that is bringing fun and uh, and uh, and it, that can clear your mind because you're spending a couple of hours a week on this and you refresh, you reboost your mind. And you, for sure, you're going to bring this uh, freshness on your daily job. Mm -hmm. So those, those two things, if you have to, because time becomes an issue and time becomes a question for most of the coaches because they have a deadline for the, for the scouting report, for the next game. For, so I know that it's a very intense schedule, especially now with the, with the EuroLeague schedule. How much time would you allocate if you put those two together? How much time would it take? At least uh, three hours a week. They are three enough. hours a week. That's three it. hours a week are enough because you can work out in the morning. That's what I'm doing. And I don't want to mention the coaches because I don't want to uh, spoil their privacy. <laughs> of course. Of course. But believe me, uh, the best moment of the day is working out in the morning as you wake up. And you can do it if you're in an hotel. You can do it if you're going to your practice facility. Just go there like one hour before the meeting. And you can practice. You can take a shower. And being fresh and mentally keen for the meeting as well. So you're not coming, you know, you woke up last third, uh, hour before, you know, and you have to drink like a half liter of coffee just to be fresh and ready to go. If you have this habit, it has to become an habit because it's not a question of doing once in a while. It's absolutely the, the best investment on your, on your health. So for sure, strength training is easy to be managed for a basketball coach. The second part is up to you. As you get a day off, uh, if you have friends, you can go play in a paddle in the evening, in the afternoon. Do you like just a walking outside? Go walk inside. Find your, uh, let's say, activity because what is bringing fun to me is not the same yeah. for the rest of. I, I like skating, for example. I'm like, I got mountain behind my back. I like to go skiing when I can. So all of us, we are different. And uh, we can find our activity, but find one. So the task is find the activity that is bringing fun to you and that, is, that can clear your mind. That's one thing that you also said that that uh, sometimes I have a hard time portraying to coaches or to colleagues or to other other people who are maybe in the office. They underestimate the 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 value it has to your brain, and this is something I learned through other podcasts as well. And uh, the BDNF, brain derived yeah. neuro neurotropic yeah. factor. Yes. That's you, you is it. Study that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that, is that, is that, this was, I was, I was thinking, you know, there are bigger studies 
from Harvard, big studied, uh, studied, uh, studied uh, applied for, uh, for college students, for high school students. And they brought this advantage. If you can just interrupt your studying activity with 15 minutes of activity, high intense activity, also your performance on, uh, on learning and studying or, or, or being a value in a meeting, it's 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 growing. It's becoming higher and higher. Even so, even yeah, even studying or learning languages while you're cycling or while you're doing the the on a treadmill, something something light. It's it improves the learning capabilities. Yeah. And also, I was told I I remember that if you train your legs specifically for that, because legs they have a bigger volume of muscle in, in with the quads and the hamstrings and the calves. It has a bigger volume of blood circulation that's going to go yeah. through your through your body and then also impact oxygen the brain. Oxygen on the brain, you know, yes. the amount of oxygen that can be uh, used from the brain is higher if you're making, uh, let's say, total body activities. Okay, yeah, for sure. yeah. Locomotion and using legs is uh, one of the main uh, advices. All right, perfect. All right, that's that's a good lesson. We pivot again. Now we're going towards proballers.com, the segment that I wanted to show to you that we're going to go through one box score specifically, and that's going to be the transition into our player topic um, that we're going to okay. analyze. So uh, let me share it real quick for everybody who's on the audio, go to the YouTube channel and uh, enjoy this uh, little segment. I'm going to show it to you now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, I, I was going to, I was, I did some, research beforehand just to find a team that's gonna the example could work on because i was also curious and i'm gonna go into Panathinaikos, and this is without any kind of um uh, i mean specific that was just something that kind of fell into place there was no specific reason for that but i also looked through the game Panathinaikos jagers uh, that they played last week it was a double week uh, keep keep in mind that was the second game of the double week yes. on the on the friday and the next game for Panathinaikos, I believe, was on Monday because that was the, the game that they, I think, that they lost in the local uh, oh. league. And I wanted to, we don't know how, what the, this is just, you know, it could be any team. Let's call it, let's call it, okay. uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, some team in the second league in New Zealand. Uh, but if we look through the minutes, uh, now 34, 34, 34, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, 16 and 17. So you have seven players um, that played four players that played 30 minutes or plus, and then one player 25 and then other 17 and 16. Now the travel schedule that we're going to go through that they have to travel back. The teams have to prepare themselves for the next day. How do you prepare the next two couple of days in terms of recover recovery and splitting up the groups of these seven players and the other players that haven't played as much or not, not, not at all. Okay. Before going uh, to, I mean, to, to answer to your questions, let me, let me say something uh, that is a big, big uh, challenge for all the EuroLeague organization. I think uh, we have 12 players. Okay. So we're going to play, we are, we are playing a game with seven right now. And, uh, and 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 it's not easy because uh, you you can try to play a game with ten players on the paper, but at the end the game is calling you know your subs is calling uh, your minutes uh, how the player is performing. So theoretically we are very uh, you know after a game is easy to discuss you know about okay why he didn't play with a ten player eleven players they got so all of them are very good players, but this is absolutely one when a known science and this is so difficult you know uh, to make a proper uh, minute sharing you know for a season because it's the same situation in nba as well you know how much your uh, let's say uh, top franchise players are playing every game for the whole season are you fixing uh, the amount of minutes uh, uh, they're going to provide you proper feedback are you sharing information so that's the most important part and so to be proactive, this is why I want to start from here, you know. Mm -hmm. So now we are trying to solve the problem. But for me, problem solution is coming to understand the problem and try to proact, not to react. Now we are reacting, but it's not the best solution. Okay. So now we try to react. For sure, if I'm putting this team on the floor again in 48 hours, 
you know, players that did play 34 minutes and they did travel from Kaunas to uh, Athens. I don't know where they, they did play after 48 hours. The day after, you can decide to give them a day off. Day off doesn't mean that they're not working because for me, a day off is recovery and uh, treatments procedures mandatory. Okay. So they are coming to the mm -hmm. gym, they're coming to the arena to do some recovery procedures. Uh, players that has just a few minutes, but I cannot judge one game. For example, no, we are doing, uh, we are monitoring training load for each player for the whole season, because we have to decide which uh, um, which of them needs a individual workout to compensate the game, the missing minutes during the game. And is individual and is not just coming from one game, is co is coming from the last microcycle and the balance between the chronic load, that is the load that you had during the season, and the, the load in the last part of the of the season. In this case, the last microcycle, last uh, uh last microcycle for game for them means four games, six days, like mm -hmm. for us one time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have to decide if uh uh, these players that they play just one minute, two minutes, three minutes need an individual workout, but also the individual workout, workout has to be very strategic because if, if these players got to play the day after 25 minutes, because they have the rule of domestic players as well. So I don't know how many, I cannot stress them too much the day before because I'm not bringing a value with the workout plan in that specific moment. So the day after for sure is a recovery or could be a light activity. Uh, morning on the game, for sure, the coach has to prepare the game. Hopefully it will be a walkthrough. They have to prepare, you know, uh, plays and defenses, you know, how they're going to play against the opponent. And it will be important to have like a, a morning walkthrough because if you're, if you're playing at four o'clock in the afternoon, okay, you cannot have a, a walk through nine o'clock in the morning. You can do it, but it's not, you know, the easiest uh, uh, moment of the day uh, for, for a workout, you know, because you, you got to plan meal, you are plan therapies and treatments and, and, and so on. In the NBA, for example, many times can happen that the walkthrough is done at the hotel in a ballroom just because you put some tape on the floor and you try to, you know, uh, to, uh, to mimic some of the, of, uh, of the of the moves that you are doing during the game, some of the of the strategies that you are applying during the game. So for sure, for me, an active recovery is the best solution for the day after. Because if I let them go, they can just sleep. They, okay, sleep is important. But you know, if your body is stiff, just uh, lying uh, on a seat, on a bed, on a couch, or watching Netflix the whole uh, the whole day is not the best solution. Mm -hmm. So I prefer uh, to move players, light activity, um, you, you know, just to get loose, uh, uh, having the chance to to see them before the light workout with treatments, after the light workout with the other treatments, because this can accelerate the recovery pro uh, process. Yeah, I think I think this is important to illustrate that that strength and condition coaches, head of performances, performance coaches, they use the box score as well to get information out of it. And I think that you know on probals.com you can find that all sorts of statistics. But also it's important to take a to to take note of the minutes as well of the players. And sometimes yeah, these you have things the minutes are... of the game, but coach has to take care about every single day yeah. for every single player. You know, this is what we are trying to do in a, in a, in a, in the best way because i have to decide which one is the player that need uh, the work the need an individual workout which player need just a recovery which kind of recovery you know because also recovery is different from player to player uh, guards uh, compare with the center you know the physical effort is not the same body size is not mm -hmm. the same Mm -hmm. So the, the recovery ability is very individual. So as you work with the players, you learn from your players, you share indications to your players, and 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 it's important after the say a few months understand which is the best solution that can pay you off. Yes.
I I totally agree. It's in, in the, like again, we back to the same thing. There's not abs- there's not one absolute truth. You know, there's a it's a it's everybody has their own way of of recovering and has their own truth to their recovery process. And that's it's a good transition to the data that I wanted to also analyze or talk to you about. And if you had to choose, and I, I know it's a vague question, question because it's hard it's hard to really say which data is important. For this player, it might be this data may be important. For another player, a different set of data may be important. If you had to prioritize what kind of data do you follow throughout the year, throughout the season, that you feel like you the team can't go without? And keep in mind, there's also teams or team executives with lower budget teams that are also don't have the, the significance of, of, you know, that don't have the budget to buy this kind of significant uh, data, data trackers, what kind of data at the bare minimum that they, they, they should track. And that's most important for the teams to, to have versus luxury. That's absolutely uh, the top, top of the market right now. Like you say, it's easy to collect now. Nowadays, it's very simple to collect information data, but data by itself is just noise. Uh, you have to prioritize data. You have to put some order, uh, different value. And uh, this is usually the question my students are doing because they have no big budget to, to buy technology, mm-hmm. to track any single movements of players on, on the floor or, or uh, in the gym. Uh, I'm telling them, and I brought this uh, this topic in a, in a clinic in Hungary a few weeks ago, how you can make training load without technology, if it's fact or fiction, you know? Mm-hmm. Believe me, science can uh, easily explain that you're lacking, you're missing a little bit of uh, uh, reliability for sure, but if you involve players to, to bring their own uh, opinion about their... Uh, recovery, about their rate of perceived exertion, RPE value, okay? And you track consistently these two values, so their ability to recover and the, and the, the, the effort they put on, on any single practice, any single uh, game, you can easily find also um, a kind of, let's say, analysis of these two simple numbers. So minutes of practice, quality of recover, uh, that is uh, that is defined like t- uh, TQR, total quality recovery, is a number, or um, RPE, rate of perceived accession. You know there are two scales. You can decide if you want to work on ten scale or twenty scale, which kind of scale, uh, scale you prefer to use it, and you can compare which is the let's say the starting the the starting ability of practice of your players, which is the effort, and this can be done every single day. It's a very mm-hmm. simple let's say system can be done in any team, in any level, at any level, in any sport. And it's the first step to clear, to, to create uh, the need uh, to invest money in technology after, I don't know, few years or as your professional experience and experience is getting better and better, you know. But this is the mind frame that is necessary, you know, just to track what's happening before practice, how much your players has recovered, uh, and how much your players have spent in terms of effort during that specific practice. For <laughs> sure, there are a lot of bias. Players can tell you a wrong number. Yeah. For sure, uh, emotionally, like they can uh, overestimate or underestimate practice. But all these uh, bias if they are well known, can be taken under consideration. And once again, is all is better a number than no number, mm-hmm. because no number means opinions, free opinions. With a simple number, you can put this uh, simple evaluation on the table. I don't know how much reliable it is. Science is bringing a lot of uh, uh, correlation between RPE and effort, between muscular soreness. Mosorness, uh, creatine kinase, and uh, total quality recovery. So you can find papers and researches that can explain you how to use these numbers. And it's, uh, in my humble opinion, a good starting point. And you, you also, and this is a very prevalent subject also as well, sleep. You mentioned a little bit of sleep. Yeah. That's also, we have aura ring. I see you have aura ring as well. <laughs> And uh, also, this is also the watch. I, I'm comparing technology. I'm trying to see if they are reliable or not. Perfect. I have all the tools in my 
in, in my toolbox. <laughs> Perfect. And that's one thing that I wanted to ask you also, because our ring is not a sponsor yet on this podcast, okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but one thing that I, I always, always hear in podcasts is, you know, aura ring and whoop strap. And Whoopstrap is also. Aura, but you can mention many rings. Uh, this is an. This is, I have Aura, but this is Gloria. There are many rings in the market now. They are coming. There's Samsung is doing his own rings. So yeah. let's say a rings that is a tracker. That's it, without mentioning products. Yeah, yeah, but it's also Whoopstrap is very, very, um, yeah. very, very popular amongst also athletes because they can just strap it around and work out, and it tracks the workout. Which which data points for the, for the sleep do you find important in in let's let's call aura ring or any other ring that that, that okay. have all, the sleep these, trackers? Uh, these uh, activity trackers are bringing uh, numbers about sleeping for sure. Uh, in the past, we are just taking uh, two simple indication about uh, let's say the quantity of sleeping, so how many hours you slept. So that's very simple, and the quality. Now we have seen that inside the quality, there are many metrics like uh, REM. So how the REM phase, how long it has been, the, the, deep, the sleep. deep sleep, how, mm -hmm. how long it was. And uh, once again, uh, when I'm mentioning the TQR, the TQR, this total quality recovery, is taking under consideration three factors. One is sleeping, quantity and quality mm -hmm. that you just express yourself. The second one is muscular soreness. So you will wake up in the morning and you feel that you are stiff and sore from the, the previous day practice or game. And the third one is mood. Okay, mm. the way I'm facing my day, I'm pissed off from the last performance. I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off from my personal problems. I'm pissed off with my teammates, with my coach, with my organization. Uh, I don't know, because I have not my contract with my agent. I don't know. There are many, 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 mm -hmm. many answers that we can provide. But once again, we can spread the amount, we can broaden the amount of the information, and you got to prioritize all of them because getting a lot of information that doesn't mean that you are doing your job in the best way. Because once again, my coaches are asking me which players are available and how much I can stress them. Mm -hmm. that's it mm -hmm. so if for these two questions you are taking 100 uh, informations it's up to you but believe me you can answer in a decent way with few information so if you are collecting sleeping information from your players from all of them okay you know that this source of information is more is very precise but it's not the only one Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not deciding players' uh, availability from aura readings, uh, readiness, for example, mm -hmm. or from mm -hmm. uh, uh, sleeping quality. Because I have seen players perform performing at the highest level with poor sleeping quality, and exactly the opposite. So the way we react to stress is absolutely individual. So you learn from your players you learn how they react and respond to games, stress, injuries. And as you learn from them, you can provide to coaches proper and, and, and uh, let's say, reliable information. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's great. And one thing that I'll continue to talk about is this, the soreness part you talk about. And I want to shift into weights because the weight lifting during the season can be also miss. You know, Some players can misconceive it and they, 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 you have to break through a barrier. What, what are the biggest misconceptions by players about weightlifting during the season? Do you have, did, what, what problem do you run into the most? Believe me, now it's easier than, uh, than, uh, than the past, for sure, because the players are very educated and open mind. Mm -hmm. So there are no very, let's say, big uh, concerns or issues about managing a decent uh, uh, strength training session during the season. Uh, for sure, coaches are getting better also because uh, we know exactly that also a micro dose of training session can be useful so we know that keeping a, a strength values through a very demanding season is one of the main let's say goal for a for a for a strength conditioning coach uh, to, to give a let's say a contribution uh, to players health and performance so players know that so when we have time to have a decent recover from a heavy strength training session, 
we know we can plan a strength training session with some uh, some uh, intensity but when we cannot plan this uh, let's say classical session because we have a lot of games we try to split the session and we work on the micro dose and our players can easily lift the day before the game the day of the game after the game so as you adapt yourself your body you know to activate the neuromuscular system to this stimulus can be done in different ways so it's not just strength training to improve strength but mm -hmm. is how you can activate your neuromuscular uh, system to perform basketball so as you move let's say the logic for your activities on a pure strength training session to be stronger that is questionable and you move let's say the the focus on activating your neuromuscular uh, system to perform basketball you cannot find a player to say no i'm not doing it and the, the, those things are I mean, the players feel it feel the the results so by learning by doing kind of thing so it takes it takes a little bit to get adjusted probably but once they feel the results of it i feel like they there's a lot of players i've seen that they start listen, lifting on game on game day and they just feel a much stronger and much much more crisp during the game because of that i'll tell you this story this is a story from history of basketball hmm. my season 2001 i was in virtus bologna with coach messina and we had in our let's say team you know uh, celebrities of basketball like Manuel Ginobili, uh, Marco Jaric, uh, we had uh, David Anderson, uh, Matthias Modic, uh, you know, a team that won Euroleague. Okay, so we had a big problem because our say uh, arena was in Casalecchio, so outside uh, downtown, and our practice facility was at Arcoveggio, where we had a, a weights room. So we have the weights room uh, at the arena. So the problem was uh, morning of the game, so shoot around at, uh, I don't know, 11 o'clock. My players, not the whole team because it wasn't mandatory, but believe me, I had like six players every game coming to Narcoveggio, lifting, taking, <laughs> taking the car and going straight, you know, to Casalecchio. But sometimes in Bologna, there are some traffic problems, you know. And, uh, you know, I was the first one going to Casalecchio just because I don't want to have any kind of problem with the coaches. They're just waiting my players coming, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, slowly than me. And for me, it was a kind of nightmare. But 20 and plus years ago, players were lifting before the game because they felt an acute benefit on doing it. Not before the game. They were doing before the shooting round, you know, just a quick lifting, two, three exercises, high intensity, go shooting, feeling, you know, refreshed and ready to go, taken up and ready to perform. 23 years ago. Wow. That's so let, let's shift a little bit towards the coaches in this whole, in this whole uh, preparation process. And I specifically in the preparation process, what did you feel over the years? What mistakes, because we're trying to avoid mistakes with this podcast as well, trying to project a little bit in the future to so avoid for coaches to make mistakes during preparation period. Which were the most common mistakes that coaches do with maybe overload, maybe some the, the strength training, training combination of individual practices versus uh, uh, team practices? What do you see as are the most common issues that people or t uh, coaches have during the preparation period? Generally speaking, I'll think about the Euroleague because it's different, you know, in my opinion, the situation. If you want me to bring my experience in Euroleague, okay, Euroleague, you have, a, okay, a lot of foreign players, but you have like a, you know, top uh, domestic players as well. And mm -hmm. all of them are involved with their national team during 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 the summer. So that they haven't a real break uh, during the off-season period. So what's happened? When the season starts, we try to build the team. New players are coming, domestic players from national team or foreign players for their national team. If they are playing, I don't know, Canada or they're playing Slovenia or, or, or wherever, you know. So like I say, it's true that EuroLeague is a, it's a, it's a sequence of sprints, but it's a long, long season. In the past, we had a, the pre-season period you know we had four six weeks sometime eight but six yeah. 
it's like Six, average, yeah. where we can start working hard, build the team, and being ready day first, first game uh, for the new season. Now this cannot be done anymore because mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. You have a national team, players that are coming exhausted. They are coming uh, from playing uh, a lot of games in a short, uh, very short amount of time uh, where they were not working physically on themselves because they have no time uh, for doing it. And uh, sometimes we have foreign players, but some of them are taking care about their body, but some of them are not taking care about their body during the summer because they had uh, the previous season was very demanding. So they just decided that for their body, for their mind, they just need rest because I'm going to have a long season and I want to start slowly. Okay, so starting properly, I don't want to say slow with high intent, but starting properly, considering all the variables of your teams is fundamental. Because sometimes in coach's mind, you know that you have to build defense mentality, uh, system, playing system, how to adapt the play system to different tactics and blah, blah, blah. So th they have a clear program in mind before the season starts. They don't mm -hmm. want to be uh, unprepared, you know, and they know that when the season starts, they have no time, you know, on doing a lot of practices. So this is a, a very, let's say, hectic and, and, and difficult phase to find a proper uh, compromise between uh, players' needs coaches needs and and try to be let's say competitive when the team is ready and sometimes you can pay you know the beginning of the season that if you are considering that you are let's say waiting players to bounce back their performance mm -hmm. it can happen the players are not ready at the beginning or the opposite you start you know uh, pushing the, the speed very very hard and you can have right away few injuries that can uh, I mean, influence negatively your results or you're very lucky everything is going fine and you can have you know first part of the season where you are competitive but after you know players can mentally physically just gave up and you gotta wait their bounce back again i'm not pointing i'm not saying i'm just saying that this is very difficult phase you know considering all the variables and putting all the pieces together and trying to face a season considering that will be a demanding a long season is a very unknown science and uh, you know and sometimes it's easy to make mistakes exactly that's what i was going to unknown science it's it's people say oh that's a myth you know that's that's so that's a myth that that there's the dog days of january february where players are kind of exhausted mentally strained and Go because it's a long strain. Ten months is a long, long way of in high intensity performance. Plus, like you said, the national team part. There's the the myth of the national team players going into the into the hole, but it's not a myth because almost all the players that play national team, uh, especially the European players, the high intensity level because the load of the preparation period for the national team is longer than let's say Team USA or Team Canada because they have mini camps and they just go for, for a couple of days and, and scrimmage and the preparation process is completely different for international, especially European teams. So that their whole naturally is going to come. No, no person can perform for 12 months consistently at the highest level every day. It's impossible. It's impossible. So I think that that myth is, like you said, it's, it's hard to have it science-based, but if, if people are tracking the national team players for the last... 15 years, I'm sure they're going to find the similar results that they're going to go into a, a, into a whole December, January, something around that time. Yeah, I mean, the calendar is very, is very, very demanding. And you got to be able to consider uh, players differently. All of them has different needs and, uh, and uh, you got to be able to manage them in a proper way. You got you to be able to be ready from the key moment of the season, no, for sure, mm -hmm. you know, not not wasting a lot of games at the beginning or, or uh, outperforming, you know, for, for sure, you know, you, you, every game uh, matters, so you, you got to be ready for for every, every game, but sometimes you have to consider uh, players' needs, uh, you got to plan in a proper way, and uh, you got to be patient, it's true. A sequence of sprints, but at the same time is a marathon. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta be able to mix these two aspects at the same time. 
I think b- providing the players and there's also providing coaches with the breaks, you know, for just mental breaks, just to get away. And that's, I think it's an undervalued approach because in Europe, you got to be always hundred percent all the time, 120%. And it's, it's, it's just not humanly possible because you're going to burn out and then it's going to be a an end of the season. It's going to be a worse result than anybody expected. I, I, re- I, I value your time a lot. And I know we, we are already over an hour one more question I have before we go into the ATOs, because I, I wanted to touch on, I saw some article um, that you published, I think LinkedIn or Facebook that you you, you published this 1% improvement part in, ter- mm-hmm. in in regards to the music that the players are listening mm-hmm. to before the game. Can yeah. you, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. 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 There are some studies, you know, it's very, it's very um, nice. The, 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 the kind of work that we are doing for the Euroleague Play Association, because there is this group of experts from different fields that are bringing on the table uh, different topics. You know, it's normal for a player uh, to listen music, you know, in some uh, uh, moments before the game in the locker room or traveling. But we have seen on science that music has vibration and our bodies are responding different to these different frequencies. Mm-hmm. So what science is doing now, it says, okay, what, how, how we can uh, classify uh, musics and type of musics, uh, musics and uh, and songs, you know, considering for what I'm I'm trying to to get from listening music. I'm trying to relax myself. So which are the proper list of songs that can relax myself, considering vibration, because there is the individual, uh, the, the the personal aspect of appreciating a kind of music. Or not, but this is what science is bringing. Uh, are you relaxing, uh, listening uh, classic music, or you prefer some uh, indie, or you prefer some uh, uh, chill out music? I, I don't know. So science is is trying to uh, monitor frequencies and creating uh, this list of of uh, this playlist that are uh, specific for a reaction. Uh, let's say that you are to do a strength training, you know, and you need energy. You, you want to listen to music that energize yourself so you can put this energy in your workout. So we chart the list of. And it was a very interesting uh, researching group because uh, uh, there was a colleague of mine, uh, Igor Ukic, from the University of Zagreb, involving some uh, mus- musicians, involving some uh, um, science. And they say wrote uh, and, and and we share all the knowledge together they wrote the newsletter uh, trying to provide some uh, some um, uh, some indication to players but believe me i have a meeting next week and uh, and um, with a, with a colleague that was a, was a investigating that specific uh, um, field because uh, now you can also uh, read some reaction from your body uh, if the music that you are listening is a, absolutely a correctly providing the need that you're looking for. For example, I can read my heart rate variability and tell you if the music is activating the parasympathetic activity, so relaxing myself or not, or the opposite. I can listen music and I can tell you if the music is really energizing myself because the sympathetic activity is rising or not, it's just messing up my my mind and uh, okay, I'm listening music, but just noise. So in the future, we could have technology app. I don't know what is just uh, uh, the starting uh, the starting phase of these projects. But once again, we are trying to um, to help and to support players in uh, everything they are doing with some uh, scientific background. So this is why uh, we wrote that uh, newsletter because uh, be careful to choose the proper music for yourself because That's your great. body is reacting. That is, that is great. And I, you made me think of something. I have to look it up because it's, it's something that I, there's a frequency uh, for sleep. It's five to five to eight Hertz is, yeah. is the, is the frequency to, to, re, to relax. So I, there's a lot of those things that I've, I've picked up along the way. And then I hear from you to confirm those things. And then I have so many, th- and I could go on and on and on because now we're going into frequency. You're going, into the our body consists of over 90 percent of water and then you go into water frequencies okay you go into gong therapy you go into the completely different er- area where people are going to think you're a kook 
because of how, <laughs> how you talk. But in 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 regards to that, there's there is things that are that are connected and that you can take advantage of if you really properly study it and properly understand the frequency, yeah. the, the 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 water tone, because we are consistent of water and water shows reactions to other frequencies as well. So you can yeah, connect yeah. the dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, I mean, science can slowly move in any direction. And now we are trying to collect some information for some information. We like to provide this information to players because let's say, uh, you know, taking care about yourself and educating players is it, very important part of our job. So we are not just training players, but we, we like to work and to train players that are involved in the process. They should yeah. be aware, uh, you know, that uh, they are using their body to perform. They are a very important moment of their life. Can They can really bring a big advantages, not just in terms of contracts or results in sports, but also, you know, on, on their personal life and health. And, and it's a huge experience that you can have, you know, just living sports at any level. And I mean, sport professional is the highest level. So yeah. why not taking advantages? Exactly, exactly. So my last part is the ATOs that I shoot at everybody. It's a little uh, rapid fire questions. And I, I call them ATOs just because it's a, it's not going to be X's and O's. I'm not going to write up any place, but okay. I, I'm going to. So the first thing that comes into your mind, and we're going to go through them at, as, at, at the speed of your liking. Uh, if you had to choose one achievement that you think of that brings a smile on your, to your face immediately, which the, which is your favorite achievement of your career? Uh, uh, helping uh, young players to become uh, professional players. Advice from your current self to your younger self. Wise. <laughs> Be wise <laughs> right at the beginning so you have not to... To, to, to smack your face against the wall a few times just to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Best worthwhile personal investment that you've done in the past? Education. One health habit that impacts your daily life? Uh, exercise. When do you know you are pushing yourself too hard? Uh, when, we are, when I'm not uh, able to sleep uh, with the proper quality. It means that my mind is working also when I'm trying to relax myself and uh, and uh, I cannot recover. So uh, I, I I lose a lucidity. I, uh, I mean, I feel, I feel I'm not ready to perform. So when I'm pushing too hard, uh, I have to, to, to pull the brake and to slow down a bit. Best personal purchase you have made in the last year? Wow. Personal purchase... Well, let let me think about it because uh, uh, personal purchase. Ah, a cruise to my mom. Hmm. Nice for my mom. Nice. I brought my mom uh, that's not so say young anymore on a cruise uh, all together with my family. So it was a nice purchase. Great. Uh, best way to combat negative self talk. Not consider, you know, I uh, for me, not uh, uh, I really believe that it's op opinion of person is not important because not all the person are the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm not considering a lot of uh, people opinions, uh, also if they are bad talk sometimes, because I'm the, see, the best or the worst judge of myself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm thinking that something can be done differently, I judge myself uh, uh, brutally. And uh, and uh, so sometimes when people are just, uh, let's say, talking behind the back or bitching, for me, it's not important because I'm not considered all the people in the same way. This is my last question. And this is something I, I ask everybody. And this is my Tim Ferriss question that I, I've learned from him. And I, I like the, the way people think about it is the favorite failure something that you look back on that you failed at and that you learned the biggest lesson from and you look at it with a cherish with a smile with a laughing eye and with a crying eye what's something that you you're, from your failures uh, in the past that's just your favorite one when i was very young i was dreaming to become a, a military athlete you know for because at that time i was an athlete an athlete i was dreaming to have like a safe job uh, because when you are a military athlete in, in, in Italy, 
your, your, your life is safe, you know, when your athlete career quit, stop, you can have a, you know, a, a job for the rest of your life. I was young, I was attending university, I was looking for something safe, but I couldn't get the opportunity, you know, because my sports results wasn't that time so high, you know, it was a big fail and it wasn't easy for me to move over. But from there, I realized immediately which was the main, let's say, mission of my life and, uh, and to become a professional coach and really believe that uh, slowly I can build up my, my path. And I, I did it. So when I'm now you, you bring me back, <laughs> you bring back that memories, I still remember how much pissed off I was when I realized I couldn't be, you know, a successful military athlete at that time. But after one second, I start smiling. You say, wow, it was a sliding door. Fortunately, I took the right one. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's I, I can totally relate to that. That's a different story. But I, the sliding door moments are, are something that you cannot predict. And you at that moment, you don't want to know about it. You just you're just pissed off about how it goes. Yeah, but just to react. Yeah. I give to myself the 24 hours disappointment. That's what I'm telling to players. You got 24 hours disappointment for your bad performance, for something wrong, but 24 hours performance. When it's over, it's over. Let's move on. Good. So thanks a lot for this. This has been oh. this is this has been my pleasure. And I I I uh I really enjoyed this conversation because I think there's a lot of nuggets for, for people to take away and not only strength and conditioning coaches or performance coaches or mental performance coaches. I think there's a value bits and pieces for every part of every branch of our basketball world. No, oh, thank you, Benes, for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you in a nice dinner in some nice place, <laughs> but not this important the place It's important. Our discussion, our conversation, because uh, we enjoy so much you know, and uh, we love basketball. We love what we are doing. And it fill up uh, our body with energy. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, th thanks again. It's a, it was a big opportunity. And uh, I really enjoy so much this this moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Socializing, thank you. socializing is the number one thing. We, we fill ourselves with good energy and with good food the next time we exactly. see each other. Absolutely. <laughs> good food for minds. Yes. Thank All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Bye.